Ford and Vauxhall Opel were locked in a battle for European car sales in the 1980s and 90s. Any model that Ford had, Opel had to match or beat them. Ford had the Granada, so Vauxhall Opel launched an expensive onslaught in the 1980s to topple them, hoping to repeat the gains they'd enjoyed with the smaller Astra and Cavalier. Yet, by the time their luxury car, the Omega, ended production, the Granada was long gone, and Vauxhall and Opel's parent, General Motors, was running out of options, despite competing with not one, but two luxury brands. How did it go so wrong for two car companies that had been on top of their game? This is the Vauxhall Opel Omega story. Vauxhall and Opel's large cars have a very complex history that I'll talk about at the end of this video. But by the time of the 1970s, British design work had ended at Vauxhall and all new cars would come from Opel in Germany. Opel's top of the range was the luxurious Senator, known as the Royale in the UK. The next level down was the Record, which had been around in one form or another since the late 1950s. In fact, both cars were based on the same platform. General Motors owned both Vauxhall and Opel, and the Record and the Senator Royale were their two-pronged attack to take on, if not its luxury German rivals, at least the strong-selling Granada from American rival Ford. For years, Vauxhall and Opel had made different competing cars, so there were both Vauxhall and Opel dealers in the UK and on the continent. But both brands were now the same save for the badge, so a separate dealer network didn't make much sense. In the early 1980s, Vauxhall was discontinued on the continent, and in the UK, Vauxhall and Opel dealers were merged into one Vauxhall Opel network. With the exception of the Monza and Manta, every car had a Vauxhall badge, and the goal in the UK was to phase out the Opel name. So although the Vauxhall Royale had become the Opel Senator, it now confusingly became the Vauxhall Senator. The Opel Record would keep the name Brits knew it as the Vauxhall Carlton. It would also be available in Australia as the Holden Commodore, as the Chevrolet Record in South Africa, and the Sehan Record and Royale in South Korea. Vauxhall was just a name for German design cars, but Brits didn't seem to mind. The Astra and Cavalier, rebadged versions of the Opel Cadet and the Skona, were great cars and sold to fleet managers by the bucket load. Those fleets were looking for a whole range, from the smallest van to the managing director's luxury car. And once the Vauxhall Nova joined the Carlton and the Senator, Vauxhall's sales boomed. The Astra and Cavalier had made significant inroads into the small and medium sector, offering an attractive combination of solid engineering at a reasonable price that was easy to maintain. It made sense to take that same formula to dominate the large car sector, so GM invested a cool £1.5 billion to develop and tool a new large car. This was more money than Opel had ever invested in a new car. Like the previous generation, the updated platform would be used for the Vauxhall Carlton Opel Record and larger Vauxhall Opel Senator. All the design work might have moved to Germany, but the UK was still a significant market and the new car was designed with Brits in mind. They liked rear-wheel drive, so they would have it. They weren't fans of hatchbacks, preferring saloons, so the new car would have a separate boot, although a hatchback was considered early on. The marketing material would carefully hedge their bets at launch though, calling the saloon virtually as versatile a load carrier as a hatchback. For those who wanted more luggage space, an estate or caravan version would be offered as it had with previous models. American Wayne Cherry had been head of Vauxhall design in the 1970s, producing the famous droop snoot look. In the 1980s, he'd lead Opel's design, overseeing this new luxury cruiser. The 1982 refresh had taken some cues from Opel's low-drag concept, the Tech One, reducing drag from 0.42 to 0.36, but much more was needed. With the Audi 100 already having a drag factor of 0.3, the new car would put drag reduction as one of its top goals. This was the decade of the wind tunnel, and the new car spent almost 1,400 hours there. 
New design elements like flush glass and a slippery shape will produce a design with an impressive drag factor of just 0.28, the lowest of any saloon at that point. It's maybe not a surprise that the chief wind tunnel engineer had previously worked on the Audi 100. Lower drag gave the car better fuel efficiency, acceleration and top speed, which is why in the 1980s car companies were falling over themselves to make aerodynamic cars. This new streamlined design language would first be seen on the 1984 Astra Cadet and would continue with the Cavalier Ascone update a few years later. One big change Wayne Cherry made was to double the number of interior design staff. The interior features and quality had changed dramatically since the 1970s and Vauxhall Opel cars needed to invest to keep up with their competitors. Reviewers would praise the new dashboard with a less workmanlike design that embraced ergonomics. This work would find its way into Opel's small and medium cars so the team could afford to spend more on their large cars even though it might not sell in large numbers. But despite all this investment, the interior features wouldn't trouble the likes of Mercedes, BMW and Audi. Vauxhall Opel would tout cruise control, central locking, tinted windows and a sunroof, but ABS was standard only on the top of the range model. But it was the first car to feature adjustable front and rear seatbelts, so well, I suppose it had that going for it. Maybe their mindset was that some features had to be held back for the top of the range Senator. This car was one level down from the Senator and would offer just a little bit of luxury in class for the middle manager, but at a price to keep fleet managers happy. The new car used the existing range of engines, although they were extensively reworked. Out went carburettors to be replaced by fuel injection. They could be set to use the newfangled unleaded petrol that had just been introduced. It would be the first car in the Vauxhall Opel range to have an engine management system. This could be mated to a trip computer, something already available on rivals' cars. Those engines would use an existing Japanese automatic gearbox that was used on the Senator, but the 5-speed manual would be all new and designed in-house. In the UK, the new car would remain the Carlton, maybe because there had been enough name changes with the slow removal of the Opel brand. But on the continent, the 30-year-old record name would end. The new car would be known as the Opel Omega. A lot of work went into this new car. 7.6 million miles of tests have been conducted. Design work had begun in 1981 and it would launch at the end of 1986. Ford missed the mood of the market in 1982 when they launched the Jelly Mold Sierra. They missed again when they launched the third generation Granada with a hatchback. Vauxhall Opel cleared up after the Sierra misstep and were on a roll with their small and medium cars. Would this new large car do the same? Reviews of the new car led with its great value for money. Maybe not the best thing to focus on for a sector of the market that sold on luxury, but it would appeal to those who had already made their money and now wanted to hold on to it. But in this segment, luxury and quality should be put front and centre, and it was noticeable that press shots showed the car with a manual, not an automatic gearbox, manual window winders, not electric. It's a subtle thing, but that and the bargain basement price didn't produce the cachet that got loyal customers polishing the car on their driveway every Sunday morning. It was almost following GM's playbook in North America of producing large cars with few luxury features for a rock bottom price, which worked well in the land of large cars and parking spaces, but not in Europe, where the average man in the street preferred a smaller car to fit into smaller parking spaces. In GM's mind, if you wanted luxury, buy the larger, pricier Senator. But Opel didn't see that BMW offered luxury throughout their range, even on the smaller 3 Series. And that's a real shame, because the Carlton and Omega had a lot going for it. Criticisms were fairly minor. Parking was difficult due to the new aerodynamic body falling away at the front, and the steering wasn't precise enough for a car in this class but it drove well with new suspension and was quiet at motorway cruising speeds. The engines were lively across the range and in fact every one of them beat the engines found in the Ford Granada. 
So it was no surprise when the new Carlton and Omega were voted Car of the Year in 1987, beating out the Audi 80 and the BMW 7 Series. More was to come, with the Monza Coupe retiring, the Vauxhall and Opel brands needed something exciting until the Calibra came along. Enter the Carlton GSI 3000 or Omega 3000, with a 3.0-litre, 6-cylinder, 177-horsepower engine capable of 138 miles an hour and could get to 60 in under 8 seconds. For additional bling, the car could be ordered with an optional segmented LCD instrument panel. Although the Omega wasn't meant to be a world car, it was exported to Brazil as the Chevrolet Omega and Japan where it was eventually sold through Isuzu dealers. Holden in Australia would take the Omega and the Senator and re-engineer them as the Commodore in 1988. Maybe sensing the Carlton and Omega needed more creature comforts, the Diamond Option package went on sale in 1988, offering alloy wheels, metallic paint and leather trim, features that had been available on many competitors' cars for years. There was also a stretched six-door version, pitched less as a limousine and more for large families of up to eight people and for the taxi market. Opel celebrated an historic milestone in 1989 when an Opel Omega became the 25 millionth Opel to roll off the production line. The 3000 GSI was quite fast, but Ford had wilder creations like the Sierra RS500. BMW had the M5 and Audi was using V8 engines and its Quattro four-wheel drive system to make quite interesting cars. Parent General Motors had just purchased Lotus and some bright spark had the idea of asking Lotus to sprinkle their pixie dust all over the Opel Senator. Quickly though it became clear that the Senator wasn't a good choice. The V8 they picked wouldn't fit in the engine bay and in any case the Senator was laid back luxury not hell for leather power. The Carlton Omega however already had a sports model so it made sense to pep up the range with something spicier. The result was certainly spicier. The standard 3.0-litre engine was enlarged to 3.6-litres and given a couple of turbochargers. After Lotus had finished tinkering under the hood, the engine had gone from 174 horsepower to 377 horsepower. It was mated to the only gearbox Lotus could find in the General Motors parts bin that could actually handle all this power, the six-speed from the Chevrolet Corvette. Chevrolet were apparently not keen to let Lotus use it as it was a Corvette exclusive, but Lotus got their way. The rear diff came from the Holden Commodore, and suspension of course got the Lotus treatment, and the Senator's self-leavening suspension was bought in for good measure. The tyres were the same compound used on the Lotus Esprit Turbo, because that was the only one that gave it better high-speed stability and performance in the wet. It mirrored the work Lotus had done souping up the Cortina for Ford in the 1960s, but this car was on another level. To be honest, it was on another level to any other passenger car of the time. 60 miles an hour came in only 5.2 seconds, with a top speed of 176 miles an hour. The only other passenger car that could beat it was the Alpina tuned version of the BMW 5 Series, the B10 by Turbo, and even then, only just. A handful of Vauxhall and Opel dealers were lined up to sell this potent passenger car, but production hit a snag. Opel hadn't been keen on this car from the start and refused to make it on their production line, or even use the Vauxhall Opel name. So finished Opel Omega 3000s were shipped from Germany to the Lotus factory in England, where the car was stripped back, customised, resprayed because of all the work needed, and shipped off to dealers as the Lotus Carlton and Lotus Omega. This, of course, made it very expensive, double the price of a regular 3000 and four times the price of a basic car. GM had hoped this collaboration between the engineering smarts at Opel and the performance knowledge of Lotus would get them a lot of press. Well, it certainly got them a lot of press. The UK press was up in arms about this fast, rebellious car and questions were asked in the Houses of Parliament. Who would ever need such power on regular roads? They asked Vauxhall to limit the top speed or ban it altogether. Surely nefarious types would use it to do nefarious things like they'd done with the Jaguar Mark II in the 1960s. Well, they were right of course, and the police, equipped with regular Vauxhall Carltons, couldn't catch it. 
This infamy likely only increased interest in the car though, but even so sales were a disappointment, likely due to the high price and the recession in the early 1990s. Only 950 were ever made, with two thirds of them being sold on the continent. Almost unnoticed because, well, why would you? At the same time, the Carlton GSI 3000 Omega 3000 got a 24 valve boost to 201 horsepower, dropping the 0 to 60 time down to 7.6 seconds. Given this was much less expensive than the Lotus model, it may have been the smarter purchase. Members of the Hawley Round Table obviously agreed, as they used this car to set a world record time, driving 4,100 miles in their quest to visit all 12 EU countries in under 78 hours. Opel worked with tuning company Ermsha to make a homologation special Opel could use to go racing, the Omega Evolution 500 3 litre 24 valve, with an engine that produced 230 horsepower. As its name suggested, only 500 were ever made. A small facelift appeared in 1991, bumpers were painted and the fog lamp detail under the headlights changed. There was additional sound deadening and a small change to the materials inside. Both the saloon and estate got a 2.6 litre six cylinder engine. One area the Carlton and Omega were falling behind though in was safety. Adjustable front and rear seat belts could only get you so far. So this was the top priority for the next generation car. The safety cell became more rigid, it got better side impact protection with twin door bars, and inside there were drivers and a full size passenger airbag. Seat belts had pretensioners and ABS was standard across the range. Although the wheelbase didn't change, the new car was longer, taller and wider. That translated into a little bit more legroom, but overall the platform had few changes. This wasn't the revolution of the previous car. Car companies are always looking to save weight, which translates into a faster, more fuel efficient vehicle. And if a part can be removed, then all the better. A good example of this was the new Omega headlights. New plastic lenses replace glass. That and integrating them more seamlessly into the body meant savings of around a kilogram. The four cylinder engines were carried over along with both manual and automatic gearboxes, but the large V6 engine was all new and assembled at Ellesmere Port in the UK. Vauxhall's brochure called its turbo diesel option generally recognized as the world's finest of its type. What they didn't mention, it was from competitor BMW. The top of the range car, the Senator ended production. This meant that the Omega, as it was now known both on the continent and the UK, was now the new range topper, so it was pitched as the height in luxury. In contrast with the previous model, the new car was pictured with electronically adjustable seats, electric windows, air conditioning, and an automatic gearbox. With cell phones becoming popular, the new Omega offered an integrated phone option. It included hands-free calling, but in the age before Bluetooth, hands-free only applied after dialing and was a glorified version of a speakerphone with the audio coming out of the driver's side speaker. With GM owning 50% of Saab, it's surprising that Saab didn't use the Omega platform. The new Saab 95, the largest car in the Saab range, would be based on the smaller Opel Vectra. Maybe GM didn't feel Saab had enough volume to support a larger car at this time. In North America, the Omega was rebadged as the Cadillac Catera. GM was hoping that focusing on the car's made in Germany roots would help Cadillac take the fight to its German luxury rivals. Like the previous version, the new Omega would be used as the basis for the Holden Commodore. That car would then be sold in its Holden Calais form to Brazil as the new Chevrolet Omega. It was also used to produce the two-door Monaro Coupe that was sold in the Middle East as the Chevrolet Lumina Coupe, in North America as the Pontiac GTO, and in the UK as the Vauxhall Monaro. So it came to the UK both as a German designed car and as an Australian designed car that was based on a German designed car. Car production is a very confusing game. A 100 million pound facelift arrived in 1999. The front and rear got an update and there was a new version of the dashboard. A simple navigation system arrived in 1997, but with the new version, it got a full color screen. GM's OnStar concierge service also arrived and air conditioning was now a standard feature. 
Side airbags appeared built into the front seats. The petrol engines all got a small improvement and the BMW diesel was joined by an Opel produced diesel engine. The Lotus Carlton Omega had been a success, sort of, if you believe there's no such thing as bad publicity. Opel obviously thought so as they started working on a new very fast Omega. They'd gauge customer interest with the Opel Omega V8.com concept because of course they added .com because it was 1999. Today, OmegaV8.com takes you to this website and I suppose it makes sense that some enterprising Omega fan would claim the domain. Back in 1999, it took you to this website and unfortunately I don't have Flash version 4 installed. If I did, I may have got to a website that told me about a car that was intended to be a rolling mobile office, not just for rear passengers, but also for the front passenger as well. They could also watch a film or video conference if they so desired, but good luck trying to do that with 2G data at highway cruising speeds. It's not entirely clear why a mobile office would need a 5.7 litre V8 engine, or indeed why this needed to be an estate car. How fast did you need to transport cargo? Maybe the public reaction told Opel that they needed to think again. They would, refocusing on speed and excitement and dropping the dot-com moniker. Their car did, after all, use the V8 from the Corvette with almost as much horsepower as the mighty Lotus Omega, so shouldn't that be celebrated and Uber Omega? And Opel made it clear that this new design was intended for production. The new Omega V8 was shown in the spring of 2000 and the production car will be ready by the end of the year. Yet, just weeks from launch, the Omega V8 was pulled from sale and Opel announced that the V8 project was dead. The reason? Well, it was a similar problem that Lotus had had 10 years earlier, finding a transmission capable of handling all that power. The Corvette's automatic gearbox couldn't handle the power at sustained autobahn speeds and there wasn't a good alternative, manual or automatic. It didn't help that the Omega's platform originally laid out in the 1960s wasn't designed to take a V8 engine, so a lot of rework was needed to shoehorn it in, a problem that befell the Lotus Senator project 10 years earlier. Opel admitted defeat on a car that could have taken the fight to BMW and Mercedes. By 1999, 50 million Opals had been produced, and again, it was an Omega that celebrated this milestone. The following year, Opel celebrated their 100th anniversary with special edition 100 versions of their entire range, including the Omega. Opel might be 100, but the six-year-old Omega was already showing its age. Opel presumably expected that Omega sales of the second generation would be higher than the previous generation, now it was doing double duty covering the Senator market, but it actually did worse. No one was denying the Omega was a well put together car, but it depreciated faster than, well, something that depreciates really fast. At least those who bought the car used got themselves a bit of a deal. Production ended in June 2003, the last rear wheel drive that Opel produced. It was supposed to end months earlier, but there was a late rush of orders, particularly for the estate, so production lines kept running. In the end, over 950,000 first generation Omegas and Carltons were produced and almost 800,000 second generation cars left the factory gates. It wouldn't quite be the end for the Omega platform though. Brits could still get the Vauxhall Monaro until 2006 and it would be used for the Holden Commodore until 2007. Customers were moving to new large cars, the Frontera SUV that was a rebadged Isuzu and the Sintra minivan. They were also deserting mass car makers like Opel for premium brands like BMW, Mercedes and Audi. Ford had abandoned the large car sector in the 1990s, but Opel wasn't quite ready to throw in the towel. They launched the smaller Signum to replace the Omega, pitched as a more versatile car for less money. But as it was based on the Opel Vectra platform, it could be seen as a stretched Vectra estate. Opel teased a proper Omega replacement coming in 2006, but that failed to materialize. GM were finding it increasingly difficult to compete with luxury brands, so they threw their weight behind Saab and selling imported American Cadillacs. Both efforts would bear little fruit. Opel thought Europe wanted a large, good value car in the 1980s and 90s. 
they misjudged the market. Customers wanted the cachet of a luxury brand and were willing to pay a little bit more to get it. A car with the same badge as a budget Corsa wasn't going to cut it. Opel is now part of the Stellantis group that includes Jeep, Fiat, Peugeot and Citroen that's been focusing on small and mid-size front-wheel drive and all-wheel drive cars. And although Opel was the top European brand when the first Omega was being sold, today it's no longer in the top 10. But that's not to say that Opel won't return to large luxury cars. In 2022, Stellantis were almost as profitable as Mercedes-Benz, so they have a war chest to branch out into new areas. With a wealth of brand names, it's not out of the realms of fantasy to think that Stellantis might turn Opel and Vauxhall into a luxury brand and bring back the Omega name. But then again, it can be argued the Omega failed, not because it wasn't a good car, but because it had the wrong badge. Vauxhall and Opel's history of large cars is very confusing, so I spent a little bit of time trying to get my head around it. The following bit is my attempt to make sense of it all. Vauxhall had various large cars in the 1980s, the Viceroy, Royale, Carlton and Senator, but what were their origins? Well, in the 1950s, Vauxhall had three large cars, the Victor, Velox and Cresta. The Velox ended production in 1965. The Cresta used the German Opel Record C platform in 1966 and the Victor, the Opel Record D platform in 1972. The Opel Record started out as the Olympia in the 1930s, then the Olympia Record in 1953 and finally the Record in 1957. By 1977, both the record-based Cresta and Victor became the record-based Vauxhall Carlton. The Carlton would keep going until 1994 when it became the Vauxhall Opel Omega, then the Signum, and finally the Insignia, which is still on sale today. Just to confuse things, if things weren't confusing enough already, Opel made the Commodore from 1967, also based on the record. In 1978, the third generation Commodore was sold as the Vauxhall Viceroy. The record was Opel's large car, but Opel produced three other large cars, the Capitan, Admiral and Diplomat. The Capitan was killed off in 1970 and the Admiral and Diplomat were replaced by the Opel Senator in 1978. A version of this was sold as the Vauxhall Royale in the UK, then the name changed to the Senator in 1983. These cars have been Holdens, Dayus, Saihans, Buicks, Chevrolets, Saturns, Saabs, Fiats, and even the Hindusan Contessa. Clear as mud? Excellent. If you like the history of the Omega, you'll love the history of the Vauxhall Cavalier Opel Ascona, or maybe you won't. Well, either way, there's a video about it on the right. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.